So welcome everyone to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Find Food from the Farm. A few logistics before we get started. If you haven't already, make sure that all the other applications on your computer are closed. Um, this will help with your webinar reception. Also, go through the audio setup wizard found under the Tools tab on the top left of your screen. Um, and also, please use the chat box um, for questions as we go along. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can during the presentation, and we'll definitely make some time after the presentation uh, to answer any questions that come up. And one last thing, if you haven't already, enter your email address into the chat box um, so we can send you follow-up information after the presentation. So our presenter this evening is Phyllis Trier. Trier is the founder and former president of Bittersweet Pastries, an award-winning wholesale food service mail order frozen dessert company. She has worked with food service distributors, brokers, sales reps, chefs, and specialty markets. Her work has given her experience in all aspects of product development, marketing, and sales. And we're lucky to have her sharing her knowledge with us this evening. Welcome, Phyllis. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sound OK? Sounds great. Can you hear me? Yep, okay. you sound great. <laughs> All right. OK, we're going to get started. Um, could you folks let me know uh, if you are just in the concept stage of a new business? Perhaps you could put a little um, green check mark next to your name. Or if you're already established, and uh, you want to move ahead into new markets, maybe you could put a, a red check mark. Does that work, Jessica? Does that make sense, Jesse? Yeah, that, that sounds good, Phyllis. Uh, for those of you who aren't okay? familiar, the check box, there's a red check and a green check underneath the list of names there, and you can use that tool right there. OK. That just gives me an idea of <clears throat> where you're at. and. Uh, I have a, a lot of information to give you. It may be, seem overwhelming, but uh, there's so much uh, to learn about the specialty food business, and I figured people are at different stages. So I'm hoping that um, <clears throat> some of you will avoid some of the mistakes that I made when I got started. So, OK. Um, so first up, uh, what we'll be covering tonight is uh, understanding what you need to know when developing a specialty food product from your farm, <clears throat> identifying your target market, developing your recipes for larger production, costs, pricing, and packaging, getting the product to market, licensing, insurance, and cash flow. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so first of all, long-term strategy. Do you have a business plan, a real business plan, not just a plan in your head, a good business plan that you can use when applying for a loan? Do your homework. Make sure the information is strong. You can find uh, help writing a business plan many places. There are books, online. Uh, even UVM's new farmer's website has a lot of information. But you need a very good business plan. Um, developing a brand. What is a brand? A brand is an image that people have of a product or company, an association people make between a product and their perceived value of that product. You want to establish a reputation for your company as a producer of superior quality artisan handcrafted products, perhaps made in Vermont. Um, but be careful of using that statement, because uh, if you may be using a co-packer in the future who may be out of state, then uh, Made in Vermont uh, isn't applicable. The quality of your products, your logo, and packaging should all reflect the image that you want to project. Your company name is especially important. There's a big difference in perception between, for instance, Aunt Sally's jams and jellies and Stonewall Kitchen's jams and jellies. First, make sure you can use the name legally. If you're using a DBA, a doing business as, 
Um, make sure it's not a copyrighted name. Um, you don't want to be in business a few years and then get sued. So do your homework. Uh, you want a good logo and packaging design. Look at your competitors and other products in the specialty field. What makes their product look good? And how can you distinguish your product products from theirs? How can you make yours look different and special? You don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money on graphic designers, but it needs to be really good. You might be able to trade products or services with a local designer. Um, entering and winning contests and getting PR can help establish your brand and contribute value to your company. This is especially important if you think you want to eventually sell your company. You're probably saying, sell my company, I haven't even started yet, but um, this may be part of your master plan. So take it all into consideration. These are all things that you simply need to think about and have a plan for. I can't give you all the answers. I'm just giving you questions and uh, so that you know what you need to know. OK, how far do you want to take this product or business? Do you have a long-term vision for where you want the business to go? Do you want to keep it small and local, keeping the business simple and controllable? Or do you see these products in supermarkets or specialty stores nationwide? <clears throat> do you feel the ha you have the capacity to take the company to that next level? This vision will affect all of your business decisions and should be part of your business plan. If you don't have a plan for how you want the business to grow, you'll lose control. A business can take on a life of its own. It really can. Do you know how much it will cost to, to develop this new product? You need to research potential production facilities. Um, speak to the managers. They will give you a great deal of information. We'll talk some more later about incubator facilities. <clears throat> they can really help you a lot. Explore production and pack packaging options and equipment. You want to speak to as many people as possible. Ingredient and packaging suppliers can give you a lot of information. How much money will you need to invest before you make your first sale? You have to buy ingredients, packaging. You have production and storage costs, maybe labor, overhead. Consider advertising and marketing expenses. Speak to other small companies who produce similar but not competing products. Don't be afraid to ask people lots of questions. Do your homework. Know what you're getting into before you make the plunge. Do you have sufficient cash reserves? Most new businesses fail because they're undercapitalized. Do you have enough cash reserves to cover your overhead, payroll, accounts payables, etc., for six months or more? Do you know how long it will take to reach a break-even point? These are things you can discuss with uh, your accountant, and he can help you answer some of these questions. How fast should you grow? It's easy to become seduced by the possibility of large volume sales, lots of new customers, fast growth. But will you be able to produce enough to meet their demands? If you accept orders, that you cannot fill, you will lose the customer and hurt your reputation. Do you know what your upfront costs would be? How long will it take to get paid? You need to know what fast growth would do to your cash flow, the need for a line of credit. Taking on too many sales too fast can put you out of business. You never want to put all of your eggs in one basket. If any one customer makes up more than 25% of all your sales, and you lose that customer, that could put you out of business. You need to be realistic and maintain control. Steady growth at a reasonable rate is best. How much of your personal assets are you willing to risk? As your business grows, you will eventually need to borrow money. You will be expected to sign personal guarantees, 
sign over personal assets as collateral, or even use the value in your home or farm to guarantee loans. If something goes wrong, you could lose it all. You need a plan as to how much you're willing to risk. It's imperative to protect yourself with the proper type of business structure, an LLC or a corporation that's best suited for your type of business and your level of liability. You need to consult a good attorney and accountant when you're starting out. You must have product liability insurance, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay. Getting started. Is there really <clears throat> a viable market for this product? How do you know there's a market for this product? Have you had requests from wholesale customers? Is there demand for this product? What makes your product different or better than your competitors? Do you know your competitors? Do you know who your competitors are outside of your local area? Have you been to trade shows? The primary trade show for the specialty food market is the NASFT, National Association of Specialty Food Trade, Summer Fancy Food Show. It's usually held in New York City, but this year uh, the Javits Center is going to be under construction, so it's being held in Washington, D.C., uh, July 10th to the 12th, and you really should attend. There's also a Winter Fancy Food Show in San Francisco, January 16th to the 18th, that's a good excuse to go to California in January. NASFT's website, uh, I put it up here. If, it's hard to read because it came up in yellow. Um, but it's www.specialtyfood.com. Uh, in addition to information on the trade shows, you can find a list of all of the companies that are members. You can look them up by category. Uh, you need to research companies that are making similar products to yours. Study their products, how they compare with yours. Study their packaging, their marketing materials, their website, their pricing. Learn as much as possible. They are your competitors. Um, are they in the same market as you? Do they sell to retailers, food service, mail order? What markets <coughs> are they in? and what markets are you in. If you go to trade shows, you can see and taste the products. Try to get a price list. Tell them you're thinking about opening a new retail store and are researching products. They will often not give you a price list at the show if they want to mail it to you. Don't tell them who you really are. Just give them your name and a mailing address. But be respectful of them. Don't pump them for lots of information at the show. They've spent thousands of dollars to exhibit at the show, and they're there to make sales, not to educate their competitors. So if you want more information about them, contact them after the show. But study as much about them as you can while you're there. You should also be reading trade publications. Some of them are free, some are not. Uh, NASFT puts out a wonderful magazine called Specialty Food Magazine. Uh, I have a list there, too, of some publications. Um, Specialty Food Magazine is, is a magazine um, as well as an online newsletter that you can get uh, on a daily basis. It gives you a wealth of information about the specialty food industry. Fancy Food Magazine and Gourmet Retailer are two other really good magazines that you should be reading. Uh, there's another website, www.specialtyfoodresource.com. Um, these are just a few. There are others out there, but these are the ones that are best that you should really research in order to um, get to know and understand your competitors. So who is your customer, your market? Um, if you're just starting out, and are in the planning stage of a whole new business, you need to have a clear vision of who you're targeting. What market do you want to sell to now and down the road? What markets are feasible for you? 
farmers markets. Well, we all know what farmers like markets are like. What are the pros of selling at farmers markets? Um, farmers markets are manageable. You sell what you can produce. You can start small with just one and expand into several markets, markets per week as your production capacity increases. You may be happy to stay at this level forever. The cost of sell, selling is low. You can establish good direct relationships with your customers and develop a following. And it's a cash business. The cons. It's limited sales, bad weather, and it's seasonal. OK, local retail stores or local food service, restaurants and inns. Local meaning close enough to be able to do your own distribution. Um, the pros of selling to local retail and food service businesses are it increases your sales, especially in off-season months when there are few or no farmers markets. It helps increase awareness of your products, especially to customers who don't go to farmers markets. You might be able to establish really good relationships with some local chefs. The cons, you have to sell your products at a wholesale price, which decreases your profit margins. You will probably have to extend credit. Nobody wants to pay COD. You will have to wait for your money, and you may have trouble collecting. You will probably need different packaging, larger sizes, sturdier boxes, etc. If it's a retail product, you will need labels or packaging that meets labeling laws pertaining to ingredients, nutritional information, and barcodes. And we'll talk more about packaging a little later on. Um, yeah, we want to talk about wholesale distributors. Wholesale distributors purchase products, they warehouse them, sell them, and deliver them to businesses in their distribution area, which may be one city, a portion of a state, or multiple states. There are different kinds of distributors for different types of products and different markets. There are produce distributors, meat distributors, cheese distributors, food service distributors, gourmet retail distributors. So depending on the product, you may be able to set a retail price, but usually the distributor will sell your product at whatever price he wants, and you have no control over what he's selling it for. Generally, they want to make from 25 to 30%. And we'll talk more about distributors later as well. But what are some of the pros and cons of selling to distributors? Well, it increases your sales. <clears throat> Besides making more money, this might enable you to purchase new, larger production equipment or have your products produced for you by a co-packer or an incubator facility. And we'll discuss those kinds of facilities in a little bit. The cons, increasing your production to meet their needs. Loss of seasonality, depending on your product. Except for fresh produce, their customers, the distributor's customers, expect to be able to buy the same products all year long. Finding the right distributors for your products is very, very challenging. You'll have to extend greater amounts of credit and for longer periods, and spend far more on sales and marketing. I also want to mention brokers. Um, you may not know what a broker is. Um, a broker is someone who works on commission, usually for about 5%. Uh, their job is to find and support distributors and larger wholesale accounts for you. They will work in a small geographic area of the country and usually represent several companies. But uh, you want to make sure that they're not representing any of your direct competitors. A broker should work with the distributors in his area and open new accounts. Brokers work for you. They do not work for the distributor. But you need to manage brokers. They don't always have your best interests at heart because they are working on commission. And they're looking to make the most sales they can, which is not always in your best interest. Don't let them decide which distributors you should sell to or not sell to. 
that's your decision. There are some very good brokers out there, and there are some that are very bad. So just be very cautious. Uh, if you're talking to a, to a broker about possibly working with them, ask them for the names of other businesses that they represent. Talk to those businesses before you uh, make any commitments with them, and make sure that they are highly regarded before you start working with them. Just be careful with brokers. Sales reps. Um, a sales rep is different from a broker. A sales rep also works on commission, uh, but he is your employee. He works only for your company. They open new accounts for you, but often work with your distributors as well. What percent of commission you pay them is something you have to work out directly with them. Okay, moving right along. Mail order, direct to consumers. Perhaps you think your products would be good for mail order, uh, where you can sell directly to consumers from your own website and brochure. What are the pros and cons of this? Uh, pros, it increases your sales at a retail price with higher profit margins. Uh, it takes an existing product into an additional market. Eliminates the need for distributors. You can control sales based on availabil availability of your products. If you're sold out for the season, you simply post that on your website. It opens up the possibility for future wholesale mail order business. That's another whole market. I'm not going to get into that right now. Cons, packaging. You need specialized packaging to ensure that the products will arrive in perfect condition. The packaging is expensive and not always available in the sizes you need. Some products may need to be changed in size or design to fit existing packaging. You kind of have to put the cart before the horse sometimes. If your product is frozen, you would need dry ice, which is not readily available everywhere. Until you're selling enough mail order products to justify having separate staff just for that purpose, someone's going to have to stop whatever they're doing and pack these products. Even if you only ship a couple of days per week, it can be very disruptive to your other endeavors. So these are the pros and cons of mail order. Getting started. How, where, and by whom is this product going to be produced? On your farm or in your home kitchen? Uh, the pros of that, it's convenient and inexpensive to produce uh, in your home kitchen or on your farm with little or no additional operating expenses. You can probably do your own production with no additional labor. The cons? It may not be legal, depending on the kind of product you're trying to produce and who you intend to sell it to. You need the right kind of licenses. Not all products can be produced from a home kitchen. And there are very specific laws pertain pertaining to meat and raw milk products, so be very careful. If you have a farm to run, who's going to run this new business? A lot of things to consider. Perhaps you're thinking of setting up a new production facility. Are you planning to set up a new production facility on your farm or nearby? Do you know what that will cost? What are the pros? control. When you do your own production, you can control everything. The cons, this is a major capital expenditure and a very big commitment. Operating a production facility on a full-time basis will increase your overhead and probably require employees. Unless this is the primary function of your farm, this new side business will divert your time, energy, and resources away from the business of running your farm. A shared kitchen space. Another alternative is to share kitchen space with another food producer or rent space from a church kitchen or some other facility that does not use their kitchen full time. The pros there, you can still do all of your own production and at a low cost. You don't have to spend the money to set up a whole new kitchen when you're just getting started. Assuming that this is a licensed kitchen, 
it should be very easy uh, to get insurance and run a legal operation at a, a very small cost. The cons, it's not easy to find kitchen space to share. Uh, access, you can't always use it when it's most convenient for you. And you may not be able to leave your ingredients or your finished products there. Um, now let's talk about co-packers and incubators incubator facilities. I want to talk about incubator facilities first. An incubator facility is a food production facility, usually not for profit, that has been set up by a state or county government that offers affordable rental food production and packaging space to entrepreneurs interested in starting their own food-based business. They also offer technical assistance in the areas of food production, development, packaging, and marketing. Two of these facilities um, are there's the Vermont Food Venture Center in Hardwick, Vermont, and the Franklin County CDC Food Processing Center in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, there are a number of small food companies in southern Vermont that use the Greenfield facility. And there's a possibility of another new facility uh, coming soon in Wyndham County. So that's exciting. The pros of these facilities. Uh, these facilities will allow you to rent space by the hour at an affordable rate if you want to do your own production. Or you can do the production, or they can do the production for you. They have storage capacity and can ship your products for you. This is a good interim step from your home kitchen to a larger facility. If they produce for you, you don't have to worry about any of the production. They'll bring in the ingredients and all your packaging. They'll store it there, produce it for you, warehouse it, ship it, everything. Cons, you're working in a shared facility, so it's not always convenient, or you're paying them to produce for you. You don't have the same control when you're not making it yourself. Co-packers. What are co-packers? Many companies that have downtime in their production facilities will co-pack or co-produce similar products for other smaller startup companies. For example, a pasta sauce company might be willing to produce a barbecue sauce. A jelly company might be willing to make a dessert sauce. It has to be a similar product that would use the same kind of production equipment the same packaging and labeling equipment. Uh, there are also companies that do nothing but co-pack and do not produce anything under their own label. Those are generally much larger companies. You would have a contractual agreement guaranteeing that they will follow your formula and will not sell the product or formula, formula to anyone else. Uh, this contract would need to be drawn up or at least approved by your attorney. Um, they will only produce fairly large quantities, uh, which you would have to pay for as soon as it's produced. And you would have to pay to have the product warehoused there. So it's not inexpensive, but it's an alternative. What are the pros? You don't have to worry about production. They will work with you to scale up your recipes and your formulas. You have no employees and none of the costs and headaches that go along with employees. And you can generally continue on with this company as your company grows. The cons, you don't have as much control. You have to stay on top of them to make sure that they adhere to your exact recipes, ingredients, and procedures. You need to do your own quality control. Control is always a big issue. With any kind of production. Okay, getting started. Sourcing ingredient supplies and packaging. I'm sorry this is a little hard to read because I squeezed in um, an example here, but hopefully you can make it out. <clears throat> you need to have at least two suppliers for all of your ingredients and packaging. This may take a little bit of research to find them, but it's important. 
Because if you go to order ingredients and your regular supplier is out of stock of what you need, um, you have to have a backup source. You should order from different suppliers occasionally, even when you don't really have to, just to maintain an account with them and to be able to meet their minimums. Before you choose any packaging for the first time, it would be wise to discuss it with one of the incubator facilities. Even if you intend to do your own production in-house to start, down the road you may want to have your product produced and packaged by someone else. So you need to know what kind of packaging and labeling equipment they use in their facility or is the most commonly used and what will work, what will not work on that equipment. You don't want to start out with a bottle, jar, box, or a label that will not be able to go through an automated filling and labeling line and then have to change it a few years after you've been in business. That will uh, ruin the whole look of your products and be expensive. Properly pricing your products and profit margins. One of the most difficult aspects of developing a new product is pricing your products properly. With health, healthy pro profit margins while still being competitive. Even if the primary ingredients for this new product are grown on your farm, you need to have an accurate cost. If you sell those ingredients at wholesale, you should use your wholesale price as your ingredient cost. You need to pay yourself something for overhead and labor. You need to have a good handle on all of your costs, ingredients, labor, packaging, overhead. These costs are going to change as your business grows and expands. As your volume increases, you will be able to purchase larger quantities of ingredients and packaging at lower prices, and your costs should come down on a per unit basis. But starting out, most people don't allow enough for their own labor and profit. You may be doing all of the production yourself now, but if the company is going to grow, you will eventually need to pay someone else. There will be many additional expenses and your pricing will have to be adjusted annually. You should have a good accountant uh, if you have a good accountant, he or she should be able to help you with your pricing and calculating your profit margins. There are different ways of calculating profit margins. Gross profit margins are calculated using only your direct costs, ingredients, labor, and packaging. Net profit margins are calculated using all of your expenses, including your overhead. You need to work with your accountant on these. Once you know what your profit margins, once you know that your profit margins are at a healthy level for the type of business that you have, then you can feel confident that by increasing your sales, you will become profitable. So I have put a little example here for you to show um, um, a, a typical way of pricing out a retail product. With this example, um, we're starting out with a direct cost of $2, if you see it down there. That direct cost are your ingredients, labor, and packaging only. Those are the only three things that go into direct costs. Um, so let's say I'm going to sell this product to a distributor for $3.35. I've, I've made $1.35 in gross profit which is 40%. 40% is a very good gross profit rate. Most people would be very happy with that. Now the distributor, you can't control what he's going to sell it for. But more than likely, he's going to sell it for around 475 because he wants to make about 30%. So 475, his cost is 335. That gives, it, gives him a 29.5% markup. He would probably be happy with that. So the retailer is paying $4.75. They're probably going to retail it at $9.95 or something in that range because they want to pretty much double their cost. Um, if there was a broker involved, um, a broker is going to get another 5% commission. So then I would start out with a selling price of $3.50. The broker gets 17.5 cents on that sale, which brings you back to the $3.35 to the distributor may seem a little complicated and 
but um, this is where your accountant can help. Um, I forgot to mention, if you have questions um, as we go along, type them in. And I'll try to answer them as we're proceeding, um, if they're relevant to what we're talking about at this point. Otherwise, we'll answer questions at the end. Accountants, I can't emphasize enough the importance of having a really good accountant. They're worth their weight in gold. And if you saw my accountant, that would be a lot of gold. You need an accountant who has experience with either farm producers, like yourself, or manufacturing. Producing a food product is a form of manufacturing. And the accounting principles are the same, whether you make cheese, maple syrup, salsa, or hula hoops. It doesn't matter. From an accounting point of view, manufacturing is manufacturing. Your accountant should be much more than someone who just prepares your taxes. He should understand all aspects of your business, including your plans for long-term growth, and should become a financial advisor. He should, um, he should really become an integral part of your business, someone that you should consult before making any major purchases, or seeking loans, or changing your business plans. Probably one of the very most important uh, people that you will ever work with is, your, is a good accountant. Sometimes it's hard to know if you don't have a good accountant. but. Ask other business owners for advice in finding someone good. You want someone with manufacturing experience. OK, other business advisors. Um, it's very helpful to have additional ad business advisors, especially if you do not have business experience yourself. This could be a support group of other business owners who meet once a, once a month, or a small group of people that you handpick and invite to be on your board of advisors. Preferably with at least one person who has some experience in the food business and another manufacturer of some kind. You don't want your attorney or anyone you have to pay by the hour. If you've established a good relationship with your local banker, you might want to invite him. These should be people you can go to for advice on growing your business, problems with employees, collections, or any number of situations that are common to all business owners. Business structure, licenses, and insurance. When you're starting a new business or looking to grow your business, it's important to have the proper business structure. This is where you need an attorney. Your business should be set up as an LLC or a corporation based on the kind of business or farm that you have, so you will be protected by a corporate shield. That will protect you personally from lawsuits and other liabilities. As a food producer, whether you're selling meat, dairy products, baked goods, or whatever, you must produce your products in a properly licensed facility. In Vermont, you can produce some types of products from your home or farm, but you still need a license. You should start with the Vermont Department of Health, uh, Environmental Health, Food, and Lodging. Um, you can go to their website. It's healthvermont.gov. If you want to sell meat or raw milk products, the regulations are much more complex than any other. And then with other less risky types of foods. But it's very involved. Once you have the proper operating license, you need insurance. You should already have insurance on your farm and home. But if you're going to sell food products on a larger scale, you need product liability insurance. You can speak to the insurance broker who is currently covering your farm. Uh, this, may, this can be added on to your business or farm policy. However, if they're not experienced with food product liability insurance, you should shop around, because this is a specific type of insurance that you need. Most food companies carry at least a million dollars in coverage. If you start selling to larger national accounts, they may require an additional $5 million umbrella. It's not as scary or, or as expensive as that sounds. But it is essential that you have product liability insurance to protect yourself. 
no matter how clean and safe your operation is, there's always a risk of bacteria or foreign objects getting into a product. And if someone claims that your product made them sick, it's impossible to prove otherwise. You might be required to do a recall of your products. You could be sued, have huge legal fees, and it could put you out of business. But if you have the proper insurance, they'll cover all of those expenses and you'll be protected. So it's an absolute must. OK. Going to the next level, getting your product into new markets. Are you sure you really want to go there? What does it mean? There are a lot of advantages in staying small. You can often maintain a cash business direct with local customers and not have to deal with credit. Keep production in-house, have a manageable business that's easy to control. When you expand your business into new, bigger markets, the business begins to take on a whole new life of its own with greater responsibilities, commitments, and risks. It will dramatically change your personal life as well, for better or worse. The rewards can also be great. Just make sure you go into this with your eyes wide open. So which markets are appropriate for your products? We've already talked about farmers markets, local retailers, wholesale distributors, and mail order. Which of these markets is best suited for your products? mainly depends on your production capability. How much can you produce? You need to be able to fulfill orders from existing customers before taking on new ones. If you're making a product that can be produced with fully automated equipment, then expanding into larger markets is more a matter of cash flow. The specialty food business generally refers to gourmet retailers, but can also include high-end food service restaurants, hotels and inns, country clubs, etc., and mail order. Each of these are separate markets. Depending on the kind of product you make, there may be several markets that would be appropriate. Which of these markets you sell to is largely based on packaging and use. For instance, if you produce barbecue sauce, you could package it in retail bottles or food service size jars and sell to both markets. But if you want to sell your products in two completely different markets, like retail and food service, you will need different distributors. For the most part, food service distributors don't sell to retail stores, and retail distributors don't sell to food service accounts. So it's best to decide where you feel your products will sell best, and start with that one market. As the company grows, it may be beneficial to expand into additional markets at that time. When is the right time to move into different markets? Once you're well established in a particular market, even though there is still plenty of growth potential in that market, if you feel you have the production capacity and sufficient working capital to be able to take on more customers, you feel there's a niche for your products in a different market, then you should consider moving into that market. But again, be very cautious. Don't try to grow too fast. Don't get overextended. <clears throat> Understanding the needs of other markets. Fulfilling orders. If you accept orders from distributors or retail stores, and then you can't fill those orders, or you're always short, you will lose that customer and develop a bad reputation in the industry because people talk to each other. If a chef puts one of your products on his menu, he expects to be able to get that product consistently. If this is a product that you can only produce seasonally or in limited quantities, you must let your customers know that in advance. It might not stop them from purchasing them. It may even make them that much more appealing. Chefs understand and respect seasonality and limited quantities. But if they aren't informed and they can't get what they're counting on, they'll be, they'll be furious. They get very upset. Different sizes and packaging requirements. I've already touched on this, but every market has different packaging needs. Retailers need attractive packaging with ingredient and nutritional labels and barcodes. 
food service customers need sturdy boxes and large jars or packaging that can hold up in walk-in boxes and are practical for busy restaurant use. Mail order requires packaging that is both attractive and sturdy. Most mail order products are gifts and need special gift packaging as well as being packed in sturdy outer shippers and if it's perishable it will also need to be packed in an insulated styro shipper with dry ice or frozen gel packs uh, and they will need to be shipped overnight or two-day via FedEx. Year-round production, a loss of seasonality. If you're making a product that's made from your own fresh produce, jams, sauces, salsa, salad dressings, for instance, and you now want to sell that product wholesale, um, the market will expect to be able to buy that product all year long. How are you going to do that? Do you process a whole year's worth of product and warehouse it until your next harvest? Can you freeze your ingredients and produce it as you need? Uh, if you can't produce enough to fulfill the demand, can you or are you willing to purchase more of your ingredients from someone else? These are all things you need to plan out before going into larger markets. It might not be so difficult to buy, for instance, maple syrup if you run out. Um, but other ingredients are not necessarily so simple to come by. So have a plan. Sales and distribution, shipping. I've already talked a lot about distributors, but if you're not working with distributors, who's going to sell your products and how are you going to get them to the customer? On a local level, perhaps you can do your own sales or hire a sales rep to do it for you. Some products can be shipped via UPS or FedEx direct to the, cons to the customer. You need a plan of how your products are going to be sold and distributed before you even get started. Remember, sales is one job, distribution is a second job, producing is a third job, and running a farm, how many jobs can you handle? Have a plan. Going to the next level, getting your product into new markets. Understanding the costs. Some of these costs have already been mentioned, but you need to really understand them before you plunge ahead. Uh, increasing production capacity. In order to grow and be able to produce more products, you have to spend more on larger, more automated production and packaging equipment perhaps a whole new facility. If you are producing a meat or dairy product, that can be extremely expensive and can take years to break even on the costs. You will have to purchase, pay for, and warehouse large supplies of ingredients and packaging. You need a substantial amount of working capital and will probably need a line of credit. These are all things to discuss with your accountant and advisors, not to mention your family. Overhead. Um, your operating expenses are going to go up as you grow. You're going to have increased utility costs, and possibly warehouse space. <clears throat> You'll need office space, computers, telephones, etc. Hopefully, if you've created a healthy profit margin, you should be okay with these additional expenses. Employees. <clears throat> Taking on employees is a huge undertaking. Hiring, training, managing employees, in addition to all the costs, can be a big headache. If you can use some interns for a while, it will save you a great deal of money. The cost of working with distributors and large retailers. First, we'll talk about distributors. Once you've found some good distributors to represent your company, you will need to support them. They need a lot of samples and brochures. You or someone from your company should go to their area at least once a year and go out on sales calls with their reps, do in-house presentations, 
and participate in any local trade shows that each distributor does in his area. Some larger distributors expect you to participate in marketing programs, even refusing to sell your products if you don't. All of this is very expensive. You have to have a plan as to how much you can afford to spend with each distributor based on their volume of sales. Large retailers. Very large retailers like Costco, BJ's, Trader Joe's, or other large chains may at some point find you and want to carry your products. Be very, very cautious. The pricing, sampling, and other demands that they make are not something that many small businesses can afford. It's unlikely that you'll make money, but you can lose a lot of money by working with them. We've seen it happen to a number of companies. Just be very, very careful before selling to any really large accounts. Remember to take it slow. Going on to the next slide, we're going to talk about maintaining healthy profit margins. I think I've pretty much covered this point already, but the best way to know what your profit margins really are is to look at your year-end profit and loss statements with your accountant. That will tell you whether or not you actually achieved your goal. Then you can make adjustments going forward. 80-20 rule. There's a rule that applies to all types of sales that says 80% of your sales will come from 20% of your products and or from 20% of your customers. And it's pretty much always true. So what does that mean to you? It means that you need to look at your product line and see which products are your best sellers. Make doubly sure that the profit margins on those products are where they should be. It's okay to have a couple of products in your line that are less profitable or that don't sell as well if they help round out your line or make it more appealing to certain customers, like gluten-free products or products with a southwestern appeal. Um, but if you have products in the line that just don't sell well, get rid of them. It's better to have a smaller line of good selling products than a huge line of products that don't sell well. Likewise, if you have a few small customers that seldom order or don't pay on time, don't be afraid to let them go. This is especially important if you're positioning your company to be sold in the future. Cash flow. Cash flow refers to the money coming in and going out. When, mo when more money is going out than coming in, you're in trouble. As I've said before, as you grow and take on more larger customers, you will have to extend more and more credit and wait longer and longer to get paid. However, your suppliers will not be willing to wait for their money. If they don't get paid, you won't get your ingredients or packaging the next time you need them. So what do you do? Talk to your accountant. Often, a line of credit is the best answer. You can try to charge your customer a, light, a late fee if the bill isn't paid within a certain number of days, or withhold the next shipment. But beware, sometimes th this can backfire. The customer can get very offended and stop buying from you, and then you can't get the money that they owe you without a lawsuit. You need to be diplomatic. You should also know that most of the time, if a customer becomes defensive and mad when you ask them to pay their bills, it's usually an indication that they're in trouble and can't pay their bills. We've seen it happen over and over. A good customer will apologize, tell you they've been having some problems lately, and be willing to work it out. Um, so just beware and uh, be careful when people are afraid when people are angry when you ask them to pay their bills. Okay, advertising and marketing expenses. If you're moving into the specialty food market, you have to spend some money to advertise your products or somehow let the world know you're out there. Advertising is very expensive, but it may be worthwhile. 
you will also need a good brochure and a good corresponding website. These are marketing expenses. If you have distributors or a sales force, they will need a lot of brochures. Public relations is a much less expensive form of marketing. You can put together a very attractive press kit yourself with a press release announcing your new products and send it to as many publications as you think are appropriate, including the New York Times and other newspapers that run articles about food. But for a press release to be effective, you have to have something newsworthy to talk about. Maybe it's a new product or a new award that you've won. That's what people want to read about. Do some research on how to put together a good press kit. It's a very good way to promote yourself. Trade shows. The best way to find distributors and new customers is by exhibiting at trade shows. As I've said before, the primary show for the specialty food business is, in, is the summer fancy food show, usually in New York City, but again this year it's in Washington, D.C. from July 10th to the 12th. To have a booth of your own at this show would cost at least four to $6,000. This is not an expense a new small business can easily take on. A good way to start out is to be part of the Vermont Specialty Food Association's booth. Um, you must become a member first, but it's an affordable way to start out. You're not allowed to share booths with other, um, other companies. You can, however, go into uh, an association booth like this. Also, most states offer special package deals for new, um, for new exhibitors who've never exhibited before. Um, so that if you, you can take on a booth in that state's pavilion at the show at a much reduced rate. So that's another uh, affordable way to get started with trade shows. Increasing the size of your recipes or formulas. Different cooking methods. Uh, when you're increasing your recipes, depending on the product, you will probably need to change the way the product is cooked. It will no longer be realistic to cook something on top of a stove, in a skillet, or a stock pot. You may need to switch to baking the product in, a large, in large restaurant pans in an oven or go to a steam kettle or other commercial equipment. This is where the folks at the incubator facilities can be very helpful. Even if you don't intend um, to use that facility, um, they can give you very good advice on production methods. Um, there will be some cost um, to working with them and getting advice, but it's very reasonable and very worthwhile. Adding and changing ingredients. Besides different cook cooking methods, batching up your recipes may also require adding or changing ingredients. Some types of products can simply be multiplied with no problems, but most cannot. When you do that with recipes that have a lot of liquid in them, they will not cook the same way. You may need to reduce the amount of liquid in the recipe or add some type of thickener pectin or starch. You may need to start with larger pieces of produce in the recipe to compensate for longer cooking times. Again, this is where you should consult with the incubator folks. Also, if you've been producing a product in small batches and cutting produce by hand, you have to realize that this will now have to be done by a machine. It may give you a slightly different consistency, but the taste should still be the same. If you want to grow, you have to be flexible and willing to make some compromises. It won't compromise the quality of your product, but it's going to, you have to be willing to compromise how the product is made. The logistics of handling large quantities. Okay, so now that you have this huge vat of jam, sauce, or whatever, how are you going to get it from the pot into your jars or bottles? With a ladle and funnel, that doesn't work anymore. You need a depositor. 
Depositors are hydraulically operated filling machines with a large cone-shaped bowl. You can adjust them for the exact amount of product you need in each jar. They are very accurate, fast, and not that expensive. It will pay for itself in efficiency and save product, um, and saved product in just a few months. There are other types of specialty equipment for every type of product. So do some research. Uh, look into filling machines because they're well worth their investment. Storage. OK. So now you've produced and bottled a couple of pallets of products. Uh, where are you going to store them? Does it need refrigeration or, f or to be frozen? If you have to rent storage space, it can get very expensive. However, if you're using an incubator or co-packer to produce your product, they can, for a fee, warehouse your products and then ship them out for you. So this may be the best way to go if you don't have your own storage facility. Different packaging needs. I've already talked a little bit about the need for packaging that will go through automated equipment. That's the first step. If you're going to start shipping these products across the country on trucks, you need to make sure they're going to arrive in good condition. That means jars that aren't going to get broken and sturdy boxes. Test your packaging. Put a case or two in the back of your car and ride around round with it for a couple of weeks and see how it fares. Ship a case, UPS, to a friend or family member across country and have them give you a report. You can get a few samples or buy a couple of cases of the packaging you're considering and test it out before investing in pallets full. So be careful. Do some homework. Different cooking and packaging equipment. I really think I've already covered this subject fairly well, but uh, just realize that if you are going to do your own production, you're going to have to invest in a lot of different, larger commercial equipment. You can often buy good used, e used equipment, sometimes at auctions or on eBay or Craigslist. Just make sure you know what this equipment should cost new and never pay more than half of what it costs new. Some of this kind of used equipment may need some, some repairs. Be very careful of buying used refrigeration. Um, anything with a compressor, um, that's, that's a little hairy. Be careful. Know what you're buying. If you're not mechanically inclined and you, or you don't know a good equipment repair person, you may not want to buy used equipment. But it can save you a lot of money. Maintaining quality control. As you grow and you're no longer and you're no longer doing all of your own production, it becomes more difficult to maintain quality control. If your products are being made in someone else's facility, make sure that they are following HACCP regulations or safe handling procedures. It's up to you to make sure that they are following your recipes exactly. In your own production facility, there should be at least one person who's responsible for quality control. If the quality or consistency of your products begins to slip, your customers will notice in a heartbeat. Be vigilant. Nothing is as important as maintaining quality. And maintaining integrity of your brand. I talked about brands earlier. It takes a lot of time and a lot of hard work to establish a company brand. You want your company name to be synonymous with high quality. That brand can become tarnished not only by product quality issues, but also by where your products are sold. If people have been buying this product from specialty gourmet stores, and then it turns up in Costco or supermarkets, the perceived value of that product will go down. So your brand will become tarnished in that respect. And these are all things to think about, especially if you ever think you might want to sell the business. That may be way down the road, 20, 30 years, but um, it's 
something to think about even now. So these are all issues to keep in mind as you plan out your, the future of your company. Be cautious, have fun, and good luck. So do we have any questions? Anybody? Phyllis, thanks so much. Um, it looks like we have a question there in the chat box um, uh, from Salomon, if you want to address that one first. Um, See, I didn't see it. Hold on. He said, "If the objective." Oh, here it is. Uh, this is a question for later. If the objective is to sell the business in the future, what are prospective buyings, buyers looking for? Are there several best buys in the development of the business? When to consider selling? Well, it certainly depends on the kind of product you're making. Um, companies that are looking to buy other companies want uh, a, a business that's compatible with what they're already doing. Um, another cheese company might buy another small cheese company. Um, my company was a wholesale dessert company. It was purchased by another baking company, a cookie company. So it rounded out their business line, their line of products. Most people want to buy a product that is going to add value to their whole overall business. What they're looking for is uh, a company that has growth potential. Um, they want a company that they can easily just move these, these products into their own line, sell it to their own existing customers, um, sell it through their own existing dis distribution routes. Um, they're not going to want to have to set up a whole new production facility in order to make these products. So. Um, it's a little hard to answer that question. It really depends on the type of business, but you want to make sure that your business is profitable. They certainly um, want a business that, that is maintaining a good profit margin and that has fairly substantial sales. Um, larger companies um, won't even consider buying a company that's less than maybe between three to five million dollars in sales. Because when a company is smaller than that, they're still really in the development stage. And when, when a larger company is looking to buy a smaller company, they want a company that's already um, pretty well uh, established in the business with a lot of customers. I don't know if that answers your question or not, Solomon. If you have another one, you know, let me know. Anybody else? Any other questions? Phyllis, I had a question. Um, a lot of okay. growers are working, um, they do start out initially trying to sell to local retailers. Um, do you have any tips or ideas about how to in initiate those relationships? Do you give out free samples? Um, you know, do you market, uh, offer to do, you know, free sampling in the stores, how do you make that initial contact and, and cultivate that relationship? Um, yes, all of the above. Um, for instance, uh, the co-op frequently has uh, a manufacturer there giving out samples. Um, you need to sample your products out, but simply, you know, if there's someone you think might be a good customer for you, whether it's a co-op or some other kind of retail store, take your products in there, um, sample them out, let them see and taste. Taste is what sells the product. Make sure you have your pricing. You know what the pricing needs to be when you go in. Um, but just going in with, with product and sample and be willing to give out samples, um, that's just the only way to do it. Just pound the pavement. Go around and talk to people. Does that answer your question? Make sense? Sounds Jesse, good. Jesse, 
cutting you yeah, off. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> my mic was off. So, does anyone have any last questions here? Um, uh, go ahead and type them into the chat box. And if not, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up and um, say thank you very much. Phyllis for this great presentation. Um, it was a great place for people to get started from. And uh, we really appreciate you spending the evening with us. Well, thank you very much. I hope I haven't overwhelmed people, but um, hopefully it's been helpful. and It's been a lot of fun for me. So thank you very much. It's been very helpful. Thanks a lot, Phyllis. Okay. Bye-bye.